And now it's on to our panel discussion. I'm joined in the studio, first guests in the studio today. It's nice to be with some humans and, and not and only have the remote guests. Uh, I do miss humans uh, as a general rule uh, during this lockdown. But we're going to do a panel on remote work as a key to sustainable work life and people. And joining me is uh, Susanna Draculic, Country Manager for Citrix Sweden. And Susanna's passion is to deliver real solutions uh, with a focus on enhancing the end user experience through technology to deliver end user satisfaction. And she's got deep experience in business transformation programs and has different clients and industries in her portfolio, such as Tieto, Stretch and British Telecom. And with over 20 years experience in this field, uh, she also has a passion for sustainability in this area. And very interestingly, she's already been re working remotely for over 20 years, correct? <laughs> BT was very um, quick out in the working remotely space. Yep. So, yeah. Yep, so oh, two decades of working remotely experience to share with us. And also joining us is uh, uh, Sepa Mosavi, Futurist, Chief Innovation and Sustainability Officer at Sway Green. Yes. <laughs> and uh, Sefa Mustavi is a sustainability strategist, innovation catalyst and a passionate futurist around this topic. And during the past few years, Sefa has been uh, listed twice as one of the uh, world's 50 most influential global smart city leaders. Very impressive. Thank and you. it's also been named uh, number 19 on the uh, top 101 Swedish super talents and future leaders of Sweden list uh, published by the leadish, leading Swedish publication Vekan Zafara. Uh, <laughs> Sefa has not it. only been associated <laughs> with various innovation companies, but also the United Nations yes. and uh, chaired the Swedish National, National Committee for sustainable smart cities and communities. And I thank you both for being here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm so in very good there. company. And this, mm -hmm. we move from security sus to sustainability. And so as we move, you know, we've, we've seen a lot of people are seeing benefits from their personal life. Um, and we're going to look at this from a, the very big picture and also the personal side of it. Um, but as we look at this, Susanna, what is a sustainable workplace under these new circumstances? What is a sustainable workplace in 2020? I think every single thing that we do today um, has to have a, um, a positive impact for the generations of the future, uh, opposed to very often, unfortunately, we do things today which will have a negative impact. And we know it will have a negative impact and still we do it. So I think it's in about a new mindset where each and every one of us is really uh, taking the responsibility mm -hmm. of actually doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. So I sold my car uh, one and a half year ago. Uh, I'm not saying I will never buy a car again, but I'm trying really uh, yeah. in every single little step. Um, uh, another thing is if you, if you take... Um, work space you say what is sustainability i i like to talk about um work is something that you do mm -hmm. uh, it's not necessarily a physical place because that is sustainable yep. for me as a person yep and if i'm a person in Kathmandu waking up um today i can actually see a huge mountain mm -hmm. which i've never seen during my 40 50 years of life there yep. and that in itself is sustainable because we're not traveling that much yes uh, or we're using an energy efficient device. Mm -hmm. um, so there's so many things that we can do uh, for a sustainable future. Yeah. And I think that when we think about the sustainable workplace, it is one that allows teams to distribute. I mean, a really simple example was a, a big leading uh, Swedish engineering company. I don't remember their name right now, but they actually, instead of building a new head office, they built five smaller offices between the top and bottom of Sweden. Mm. And not only to attract talent, but to actually have people travel less mm. and to reduce travel and the, and the carbon footprint. Yeah. And, and talking about offices, I mean, it's uh, obvious that we will need less office space. So the last 10 years, more and more companies are offering more flexible office spaces. And, and I just read Amazon has made a shelter out of their office because wow. they won't need it anymore. So wow. that is, uh, yeah. <clears throat> That's incredible. Yeah. Uh, Sepa, you're looking at this from a more big picture, holistic mm -hmm. view uh, and thinking about how to use this situation to create more momentum. 
on sustainability right. strategies, mm-hmm. big picture strategies. So what are the big opportunities for us here? What are the big opportunities that we can take away? Sure. Because I, one of the great things about this lockdown, it proved so many things are possible. Absolutely. If we have the will. Mm-hmm. No, it definitely created a momentum for us to stop by and start reflecting, I guess. And when you talk about like a concept like sustainability, you talked about strategies and, you know, something holistic, holisticity, if it's a made up word. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, you definitely need to talk about future and vision as well and leadership if you want to have like a complete picture, because sustainability is not only about the environment. It's a triple bottom line approach that talks about economy and the society as well. So, I mean, if you want to go back on like, okay, what was the effect of this pandemic on our carbon footprint or greenhouse gas emissions? Yes, it's been lowered down by 20% by us only like stopping Mm -hmm. and doing like the things that we were doing. And it's actually like more companies being, uh, you know, positive on having a sustainability strategy today than like a decade ago. It's almost 70% of different businesses who want to have a sustainability strategy. It's in a study from Oxford, for example, that shows those numbers. And the funny thing is almost 90% of them think that they give them a competitiveness, like a differentiation towards doing a better business. Mm-hmm. That's really positive. I mean, we see that air pollution has decreased in many different places. Like people in certain parts would be able to see mountains that they haven't seen in the yeah. in the past and so yeah. on. But now, I mean, we need to have like a more value-based and sustainability-based leadership in order to be able mm-hmm. to take the next step, not only like focusing on our uh, carbon footprint, I guess. Yeah. You know, one of the things that uh, when I first started uh, coaching people, I was actually close to being a therapist. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I was always talking about was giving people an experience of a change is the fastest way to get someone to believe in change. Mm -hmm. And we've given people this reference experience that we can lower the carbon footprint dramatically and quickly. So, uh, you know, we if we can lower the carbon footprint by 20 percent by changing the way we work and we've had that experience, what do you think the demands people will make on companies will be moving forward mm-hmm. if they've seen this as possible and now want to be part of that change? No, I mean, absolutely. I mean, when you talk about leadership, it could be top down, it could be bottom up. So, I mean, it's all about like the corporate values and the private value of us. If we want to demand our company to change its behavior or the leadership of a company who wants to include people in taking the decision. Mm -hmm. So that's the power of the people and the power of the leaders. And we need to have a balance in there. Mm -hmm. If I look at it from an end user perspective um, and what do they demand? Mm -hmm. So from simple things such as uh, what kind of device do I have to that it's easy to that device is sustainable, so it's reused. You won't find it somewhere in Africa when it's used after just three years. Mm -hmm. It's actually used for maybe four years. Um, It's also a a completely holistic approach where both software and hardware and the maintenance of it is thought through from the beginning Mm -hmm. um, as a service. Um, So you're not buying something to own something, you're buying a service instead. So we're talking circular economy, things move from the point of purchase back to the point of purchase? So the reuse is coming, uh, I think, heavily into Mm -hmm. IT. uh, And and I think the end users are really uh, the essence of this because it's very uh, big war for talent. Mm -hmm. So if we as end users also demand from our uh, new employees that this is the kind of environment I want to operate in. So it's not just about the culture, which is, you know, giving me the ability to work from anywhere, Mm -hmm. but it's also about the hard facts. What are you measuring in order to impact on society in this company? Mm -hmm. And, and, I don't know if you see this, but very often when we go out to clients, we can really feel a difference in is there passion, is there commitment, Mm -hmm. or is it just um, compliance tick in the box? Yeah. And Uh, and this is the big difference. And you said something that caught my ear, which is work from anywhere. So you're very passionate about expanding this conversation beyond work from home. You want people to understand the new opportunity is not work from home, it's work from anywhere. And so can you tell me why you're so passionate about making sure people understand this? Yeah, maybe because I've been seeing the benefits for myself and my family and my friends and my colleagues because the environment I've operated in is really, truly work from anywhere. Mm -hmm. Um, So 
um, I, I see the huge benefits and, and sometimes, you know, uh, things like COVID had to force it upon society for, for everybody else also to see that you can go to cloud quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, universities in Sweden, they talked about doing this for several years and then suddenly they went to the cloud over a couple of days. Yeah. So it is possible um, and, and I'm passionate about it because it empowers the, the, the person. Yeah. And also, I, I think that, uh, as I said before, the experience of the change is what makes people believe in the change the most. Mm -hmm. And so, Seppa, one of the things that, that I think is I'm very, very curious about is will these work-from-anywhere opportunities be mm -hmm. really woven into corporate social responsibility policies of companies moving forward? Absolutely. I mean, when you talk about corporate social responsibility, I guess that was the first version of talking about sustainability at the corporate level, which very much in the past like was more about like having a, um, you know, a greenwash platform for different corporates. But now we see that it's changing people because people could push for it. And then you could trigger like a, you know, service leadership approach mm -hmm. so that people could actually create a safe environment for people to learn in and then empower the employees to build up capacity yep. within the company. And always like all of this kind of like budgets could come from the CSR budgets that usually like the big corporate set away. And that's very good if you could, instead of like focusing on doing a greenwash project by showing that you're doing it something out of goodwill, mm -hmm. you could create capacity for people to act based on their private values. Now, you touched on something that I'm really passionate about, which is private values. And mm -hmm. I think that you know, everybody wants to change. You know, everyone, everyone wants to be sustainable, but almost no one wants to change their yeah. lifestyle. Yeah, definitely. But if people are really happy to change their work style, if it enhances yeah. their lifestyle. So do you see the opportunity here to make the shift is, is a really dramatic one? Mm -hmm. I know this question is for both of you. No, absolutely. Suzanne, if you have anything, otherwise... No, I, I was just going to say that I have two kids and I don't want to have it on my burden that I didn't create a great society for them. So, yeah, I think, you know, it, it depends on why do you want to make the shift? Either you see it egoistically, some benefits yeah. for you, or you see it for your children, mm -hmm. or you see it for the, you know, the team or the society. And the more I've looked into this, I really see that there's no other option. So mm -hmm. I think it's about awakening uh, this insight uh, for everybody and um, everybody will be really nerdy about this yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and i mean other way of looking at this is i mean we put people into political positions and those people usually make decisions that could have an impact on how innovative we approach different industries because sometimes we talk about like we should travel less because it's an emitting sector i think we should travel as much as possible because travel opens your eyes it shows mm -hmm. you the world it enables the interaction with each other it's it's amazing yeah but then why uh, mm -hmm. air travel industry is so for example, unsustainable. And that's something that people could actually put on their list of to-dos if they're going and vote for the people who can enable that. So that's a, that's a two-way round game, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I would also just like to take this opportunity to ask the audience, uh, we would love to have your questions as well. I have a list of questions, but I'd love to hear what your thoughts are about how you feel. Do you feel better about not going to work and not driving a car and all those things. Uh, we'd love to hear your comments and questions uh, during this panel as well. Uh, Susanna, so where does the sustainability impact really come from? Uh, does does work, for, work from anywhere really enable this to scale quickly? Tell me where do you see the, the main impact points? You mentioned devices mm. as one of them. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, going back about 15 years ago, I worked on consolidating data centers. Mm -hmm. And so we know for a fact that data centers are consuming 50% energy. I mean, th that's that's the cost. Wow. And, and um, it's, it's, you know, when you know that, of course, you're going to do exactly what you said. Yeah. It's put up a goal because we need data centers, but how can we make them more uh, sustainable? Mm -hmm. So that kind of pushed the whole industry to actually do something from that heat. And now we're heating cities with that heat and mm -hmm. it's a plus minus game. Right. Um, so I, I think in IT, if you look at the U United Nations goals, yes. um, nine of them can directly be mapped towards IT. Mm -hmm. So in Citrix, we've looked at it, we've mapped which ones. And now we're in the phase of actually understanding uh, together, because it's an industry thing, um, 
to mm-hmm. put real measures. So real solutions for real needs. Mm-hmm. So it's nice to talk about it, but you have to come down to the real measure. Mm-hmm. And what you took travel as one of them. Um, one of my colleagues, uh, Justin Sutton Parker, he has an MBA in sustainability. He's looked at this. So if we only travel two days less, so if we go to the office three days, because yeah. I agree, we need to travel, we need to interact. Yep. Um, then that can save, I think it was the whole of um, Iceland and Greenland, the forest during one year, something yeah. like that. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm not so good at figures, but yeah. it was a huge uh, amount of yeah. um, savings on carbon. Another thing is devices, obviously. Yep. Um, there's devices consuming a lot. Um, there's devices that can uh, have a, um, a lifespan, which is much longer, so you don't need to throw them away. There's devices that you can renovate a bit and reuse. Yep. So having a concept of thinking of that when you're procuring, procure it as a service from people that have the circular economy in oh, mind. Already in built, yeah. Mm, in built. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Seppa. Yeah. <laughs> What's your opinion about this? If if we want to, uh, you know, have this sustainability impact in the workplace, mm-hmm. where are the places we can get the fastest gains from your perspective? No, I mean, basically, I mean, what Susanna mentioned about like inter- inter- integration of different infrastructure into each other was something that popped from like starting thinking about something that is like a part of your wasteful habits, and mm-hmm. it could be at very like infrastructure level as well. How could you replan things? How could you define the new function, for example? How could you see waste from one system and connect it to the other one? So it's mostly like the concept of smartness, which is enabled by use of data management and IoT infrastructure. And also it goes back to the principles of circular economy as well. So these are all of these different uh, you know, global trends that does it that different sectors are changing as well so I, I can't separate like one sector from the other because everything mm. is interconnected as mm. interrelated but that's like the global mindset that we need to come to terms with okay. like industrial revolution for example and the way that it changed our planet mm-hmm. what's the next green revolution for us that could like you know push the change now now we had a conversation before the event uh, to meet each other and, mm-hmm. and we talked about capacity right and what what company? What capacities do companies need to build mm-hmm. to make this happen? So, mm-hmm. can you break that down for me and the sure. audience again? Absolutely. Uh, no, I mean, basically, when you talk about like capacity building, I guess it goes back to building our future. Deep education is essential. And if you want to focus on deep education, then you need to have this service you know, a uh, kind of approach of leadership to empower people. So we see that the, the trends that are coming in into our uh, daily life, it changes the way that things are working, the way that it functions, the way that we work, the way that we buy and so on and so forth. You, you, we see that like artificial intelligence is taking over. Big data is playing like an essential role in how we design things and so on. And in order to cope those, because we know that many different types of jobs are vanishing away Mm -hmm. and many types of new opportunities are popping in. And we need to build capacity for that. So digital skills, how we need to create a momentum for people, a safe space to grow in and learn in, in order to cope with, instead of memorizing things, they need to like learn how to think critical, for example. Yep. And there are many sets of skills like that that could endure in life for people and change the perspective of a person feeling smart within a system rather than being boxed within a function. Mm-hmm. So these are the capacities that's that really I guess that we need to That's a beautiful insight. Could you say that again for me? Being, <laughs> you just said that so beautifully. Yeah. Instead of being boxed into a function. Exactly. So you need to like create a space for them to grow and think and like, you know, feel like I'm, I'm creative here. I could be innovative. Mm-hmm. I'm not a function that is like sandbox in a corner. Mm-hmm. Uh, and to, to take one very, you know, uh, hands-on example of what you said there, which is, I love what you said there. It's, it, let's say if I'm used to doing whiteboarding when I'm selling yep. and suddenly um, when I'm talking to my team or when I'm in a meeting with new people, I, I, I don't see them. Then I want to be able to do whiteboarding. So <clears throat> um, investing in your people to train them how to do things remotely that they yes. feel comfortable with doing uh, face-to-face. Yes. Uh, is fundamental, just as one example. Or we used to have one-hour meetings when we meet face-to-face, mm-hmm. but over the phone, no, instruct everybody, keep it down to 20 minutes, half an hour maximum, because yes. we can't cope. Yes. We can't cope staring at the PC all day long. Yes. Um, so um, That personal sustainability comes in. 
the, the mental health of the people is a key area to build around, which which because uh, because it's a completely new situation for mm. so many. Um, so that is a huge area in itself to invest in. Yeah, I I, I completely agree with that. And we're going to have uh, some speakers talking about that uh, later in the day. And I'm really I'm really passionate about people understanding that. You know, you said work isn't a place you go; it's what you do. But I believe it's it's a set of rituals. More than anything, for the human animal, mm. work is a set of rituals. Mm. And when we take, when we move people from one environment to another, but we don't change the rituals, mm. we're, it's almost like trying to put shoes on that are two sizes too small for you. Mm. So some tasks just don't work as well. Like one of my neighbors said that she's having four and six hour Zoom meetings with, mm. with the management team. It's completely unsustainable mm. from a human perspective. Mm -hmm. But we actually got some questions coming in. Great that you've included sustainability in the, in the summit. Uh, is there a divide between building up the anywhere, work from anywhere idea in high tech and people who work in locations such as nurses? Mm -hmm. How do we ensure we understand their constraints once our workplaces start to diverge? Right. Mm -hmm. Dramatically. Mm -hmm. There are, I, I strongly believe in when you do automation projects and when you look at um, different user groups, let's call the nurses a user group, if you look at what they're doing, um, we have identified uh, that several of the tasks done can actually be done from remotely. So therefore you have companies such as Kry in Sweden mm -hmm. popping up and they're doing things remotely. Uh, so you could actually sit in, in um, your summer house in uh, by a lake and do the same kind of work remotely. Now, obviously, some tasks can't be done remotely um, and, and you have to look at for people having to travel to on site, yes. how can you make their life more sustainable or their workspace mm -hmm. more sustainable? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's interesting when, uh, and thank you for the question because it's such a good one, that this could really start to also affect the industries people want to go exactly. into. And uh, when we look at the long-term effect of people having this ability to work from anywhere, um, that there may be in industries that people go into now where there's a lower rate of people going into them because they see they have less flexibility and opportunity mm -hmm. and therefore uh, what they might see is a decreased lifestyle opportunity when they're making career choices. Exactly. So, you know, really, really interesting implications mm -hmm. come out of these things. Uh, Sepa, from a smart city perspective, how can we use work from anywhere policies to make our cities more sustainable. Sure. I mean, let's when we're designing smart cities. Yeah. I mean, let's think about cities as our major human settlement hubs, because I mean, already today, more than seventy percent of the people on the face of this globe, I mean, live in a small, medium size, and then mega cities. So we already are settled in those kind of settings. And then, if we see that as a platform, you could see a smart city as a vision for city management, something that is in transition, because we designed this human hubs in a hurry because our population boomed and then we created these cities and then we designed this without like really thinking them through and now we are taking a step back and we try to make them smart. So it's a lot of overshadowing different function and transformation mm -hmm. and transitions and use of technology and so on that is changing things. And the way that we are redesigning different functions, you know, smart mobility for example is mm -hmm. one of those. Um, functions that everybody could talk about. But I see something as more important in that picture. And this is the mindset for the people who lead the city, because a smart city could be about technological transition and application of technology. It could be also creation of the momentum for attracting investment for driving this change. Mm -hmm. And how this environment that you create within a city has this innovative mindset that enables people to change the way that they function and they work and you know they shop and so on and so forth and it's going to have drastic kind of like influence on the way that we design our real estate the shopping malls as you said the need for office spaces is declining yeah how would the real estate branch deal with this one yeah how would they come up with different innovative solutions for doing that when people are more you know uh 
be willing to use shared economy uh, yes. resources as if they, we did it like in, in forehand. So yeah. these are like all of the different things that we need to create a momentum for becoming more and more innovative and re redesigning our, our functions, I guess. Great. We've got a couple of other questions come in. And thank you to everyone who's submitting questions. I think it makes the conversation uh, so much more interesting when we get what you really want to hear about. So Paula says we need to build capacities, yes, but organizations also need to dare to let go and allow distance working. How can we do that? How do companies get braver? Question really, for both of yeah, you. Yeah, I really love that question because <clears throat> I think that's also why I'm so passionate about the anywhere concept. Um, and it, it all starts with, uh, um, let's call it a, a manager who wanted to see what I was doing constantly. <laughs> and, and so I think it's about the mindset and, and, and um, um, thinking that you need to look for the result. So the outcome of the individual, do they grow? Do they uh, uh, make the organization grow? Do they make the customer grow? Do they you know, um, impact in a positive way? It's not about where you are physically or how many hours you put in. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, yeah, it's about the mindset thing. Yeah. Yeah. And we had, we had a lot of great insights yesterday about, um, the way technology will also be able to show what we're doing, what, what the, one of the speakers was calling digital traces, that things we do during our work day that are now not seen, that will have new ways of people seeing what we've been doing. Mm -hmm. But then you're coming into the area of trust. Yes. So, uh, and I used to be a call center manager yeah. and you know, all this regulation oh, about course, looking yeah. at what, what do you trace and how, how much do you day? follow up on yeah. people. So again, I think it's more, it's better to look at um, what, what the yeah. outcome do you desire from an individual sure. or a exactly. team and, and, and look for that yeah. outcome instead of focusing I think, I think on when they were talking about <laughs> uh, digital trace, it wasn't, re it wasn't at all about uh, this trust issue and are they working? It's what are they working on? Because when we're, you know, when we're in an office, we have hundreds of interactions a day mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where we pick up unconsciously mm -hmm. how things are progressing or we hear someone talking mm -hmm. about a project and that we need to recreate all of these micro interactions digitally somehow yep. uh, to make remote work sustainable. We had another great question. It was mentioned earlier that Amazon, I think, turned their offices into a shelter. Mm -hmm. uh, with sustainable cities in mind, what happens to all that commercial space if companies do downsize and make the shift to work from home, work from anywhere? Mm -hmm. What's the best solution here? Seppa, you take it No, I mean, absolutely. I mean, these are the new kind of innovations coming in because we obviously see some sort of like spaces vanishing. Like, okay, car parks, for example, in the cities are becoming less popular. Extra office spaces are becoming less popular. So we have some sort of unused spaces that we could do new things on. And then you see like this new kind of as a service functions that kick in and help like co-working spaces is one, uh, one of those examples that for example, we've seen in the uh, past few days being like really exponentially going up. Mm -hmm or the new functions that we started introducing to our cities, like, like vertical farming, for example, for in these unused spaces. Yeah, this was very exciting. Exactly. We spoke about this. Talk more about this. Uh, so, I mean, basically what the startup that I'm working with today and I co-funded with a couple of other people is a, is a vertical farming company that we started growing food indoors. So we had in a space that used to be an archive room for the, one of the biggest newspapers in Sweden, wow. but then they digitalized. So all of the hard copies vanished from that room and they had this unused space and now it's a vertical farm in there wow. and we are like you know producing 25 tons of leafy greens and you know fresh herbs for example for the stockholders that's amazing these are like this kind of new innovative thinking yeah. functions that are coming in and kicking in and becoming like a new norm in the city because i'm totally sure that we didn't have malls in the in the past as well but somebody came with the idea like if we create a hub for everybody to sell things and then people could see that as an activity we could have a mall yeah. so now we're thinking like again outside the box and uh, create new uh, spaces for for those innovative thinkings and of course if you're growing food in stockholm yeah it's not being transported from another country Exactly. So there's another sustainability win there. Exactly. So we get we do we do get to have domino effect mm -hmm. on a lot of things exactly. if we're brave and if we're bold and we take the initiative. Mm -hmm. um, Susanna, we when we were chatting on on the conference call before the before the session, you said everyone's talking about going back to work. Why are we going back to work? 
is what you said. Why are we going back to work? <laughs> or going back to office. <laughs> going back to the office, now, rather. Thank you. I've always been th- on work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd like to point out she yeah. has been working. Yeah. But why are we going back to the office if we know we don't have to? Yeah, I mean, uh, and I think I read Gartner, they predicted that I think it was 75% have, have in a... Um, yeah. Um, survey they did said that they will actually make this um, uh, working from anywhere um, as the norm. Um, yeah. So I, I think there's more people thinking like I'm doing. Yes. Because uh, it, and it's more about this that it's been proven that you actually don't need that huge office space mm-hmm. now. Um, so that's my thinking on why go back into that office. Yeah. Um, and one thing you said about work from anywhere, which I loved as well, is people often don't think about like you working in your client's office. That when you're on a, working on a project, <laughs> that it makes complete sense that you would go and share your client's office right. space yes. rather than... So I, I thought that was a really great insight. Yeah, and it's really about this feeling that where you work, it really doesn't matter. So if I have a supplier meeting, then mm. I always say, can I be there before and after? Do you have a space for me? Mm-hmm. And and um, it, it's this mental attitude that you can really sit down and work from anywhere yeah. Yeah. as well. as. But, but then that requires, of course, that you have all the tools and that it's secure and, and all of that. Yeah. And uh, we have another question, which is uh, from Kev, which is, uh, what are the key elements of a sustainable work organizational culture? So what are the key elements of the culture in a sustainable workplace or organization? I think we already touched on that willingness to let go. I think the previous go. talker really hit the nail on that one. Right, yeah. <laughs> and these seven habits, I yeah. think you can apply them to this uh, question also. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's about... Um, really believing in uh, that this is what we want to do um so um exactly having a vision basically. having a vision yeah, yeah being passionate being true um yeah real yeah uh, uh, i think that when we talk about the culture side of things one of the things we need to take into account is what creates culture now mm-hmm. and when i go in and work in with big organizations I always talk about that the the culture of the organization that people are sitting in is usually the one that's about 20 meters around them. Right. And that if you work for a company with 300,000 people, what is the work culture? There is some things that come through the brand and the core values and those things, but so much of what we experience in our working life as a culture is really this 20 meter circle around us and the 20 or 30 people that we interact Mm -hmm. with the most. Right. And so this is why I think it's incredibly important that we don't only think about leaders Mm. from the top changing this, Mm. but we see that it's a person-to-person opportunity as well. Yeah, we were just discussing before we came into the room that we people, we like to bond. (laughs) Um, So, um, And I think that's also, it doesn't matter if I go to... Uh, Gothenburg, if I meet you and we're going to say, yeah, we're from Stockholm in Gothenburg, yeah? Or if I go to um, somewhere in Europe, we're going to say, yeah, we're from Sweden. Yeah. And so we like to bond. And I think it's the same thing in, in within the corporate uh, environment. You like to be part of something and yeah. culture is the really strongest thing to be part of. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it's the beauty of how do you create one culture in a company? Is it possible in a big com- company? And I, I firmly believe yes, because I've seen it working. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. So uh, And then it has to be thought through and come from top yeah. down and from bottom up, yeah. both ways. And that, that culture, that one culture that people talk around, you talk about, it's, it's usually based around a really core set of values, a very clear mission, exactly. things that we talk about all the time. So those things don't have to change, but the way we distribute them mm. to people like to and communicate mm. them. Yeah. And, and as one sp- uh, speaker said yesterday on the panel discussion, there's a very big difference to distributing information and people understanding information. Mm-hmm. Mm. And, when, and uh, from her perspective, it was closing that gap. Look, I have a closing question for both of you, and I really appreciate you both being here and, and sharing uh, this, the stage with me, is if you were standing in front of a room full of CEOs from all the Fortune 500 companies uh, right now, after this talk, you walk out of this room, you go straight onto stage to talk to them. 
what would you tell them? What would you tell them about this opportunity that's in front of them? I would ask all of them to join the Just Index mm-hmm. um, um, as what is one that? thing. Uh, what that's you, what? A, that's an index. Um, um, now I can't remember his name, but Google it up on Just yep. Just Index from the US, and it's an index measuring really, you know, how sustainable are we in real. Uh, corporates. Um, so that's one thing, looking at that and, and trying to join that and trying to get in because mm-hmm. it's, you know, it's quite... Uh, um, it's hard work to get on the list. It's hard work to get on the list. It's not just uh, join and get a little sticker on your company. You no. have to <laughs> go through the audit process and yeah. measure up. Yeah. And, and then the, I, I think the other thing is really, you know, to really understand that uh, and, and everybody understands, but the employees uh, and employee experience is um, the key and that uh, your employees, that you know them and that you make them sustainable, mm-hmm. that will also make your business sustainable and mm-hmm. you will have more customers and we will all be happy. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, and I mean, uh, can I just before you comment, you know, I mean, Sweden has had an epidemic of burnout mm. in the last few years of, exactly. of knowledge workers burning out. Mm. And so I think this fork in the road is a very, very welcome one from a personal sustainability mm. perspective. Mm to reverse those trends. Yep. Thank you for your insights. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, that's pretty much like in, in line with what uh, Susanna said, because I mean, there are three different takeouts that we have that, I mean, resilience is important. We see that stimulus should be sustainable. So if we're talking about economical growth, we should think sustainability and having a long-term perspective. And then we know that you know inequity is magnified. So we mm-hmm. have a very gapped society that we need to like, kind of like see the interrelations with the economical growth. And as I see that today, the power of nations, for example, and the politics and everything has been sort of minimized compared to the power of corporates. And those people need to think that they have the ball now. And if they start like acting, we could like fill up these gaps because whatever that we need for the future, we have it today. We just yeah. need to believe in it. We can't have a word that, you know, 3% of the, the global population has kind of access to uh, almost an equal resource as the 97 other percent yes. have. Yeah. Or we have 26 people owning as much as wealth of the 4 billion poorest of this planet. Yeah. It's all about haves and have-nots. Yeah. And we need to, like, eradicate that question and build up capacity and educate people in order to fill up this gap. Otherwise, we're going to have a big problem in the future, I guess. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if I was walking on that stage, what I'd tell them is those who can change must. Because must. one exactly. of the, the first presenter of the day said one billion people still brush their teeth with their finger mm-hmm. and the next two billion share a toothbrush. Mm-hmm. And so if we're the people in the affluent societies who have the opportunity to do this kind of knowledge work from home or working from home or work from anywhere rather opportunities, mm-hmm. We're the ones who must do it because there's other people in developing countries on you. who can't make the mm. make the yeah. shift. Did you have a final word? Yeah, I I, I realize the third thing is obviously join the Citrix ecosystem and take your <laughs> services to the cloud. I mean Thank that is so <laughs> obvious, but uh, yeah, I have to say that too because then we will calculate the sustainability impact you do. Uh, Sales pitch done. <laughs> well done. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Susanna Drakulic and Asepa Musavi. Thank, Thank you so much for being Thank here and discussing the these big is- big yeah. issues with us. Yeah.